Now in the morning, we're looking at this man called Job. Uh, So far, his uh, family have been wiped out, uh, together with his income, his business. Uh, Himself, his health is ruined, and he finds himself on the local rubbish heap. Three of his friends have come to counsel him, to offer him some sort of advice, and uh, have not got very far. Uh, But now we meet someone else who so far has remained very quiet, a man called Elihu, and we read about him, uh, some of the things he says in chapter 32, verses 1 to 14, and you can find that on page 533 in the Church Bibles. So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzite of the family of Ram, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. Now Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older than he. When he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. So Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzite, said, I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. I thought age should speak, advanced years should teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty, that gives them understanding. It's not only the old who are wise, Not only the aged do understand what is right. Therefore I say, listen to me. I too will tell you what I know. I waited while you spoke. I listened to your reasoning while you were searching for the words. I gave you my full attention, but not one of you has proved Job wrong. None of you have answered his arguments. Do not say we have found wisdom. Let God, not a man, refute him. But Job has not marshaled his words against me, and I will not answer him with your arguments. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Job, chapter 33, beginning at verse 8 and reading through to verse 30. And that can be found on page 534. But you have said, in my hearing... I heard the very words, I am pure, I have done no wrong, I am clean and free from sin, yet God has found fault with me, he considers me his enemy, he fastens my feet in shackles, he keeps close watch on all my paths, but I tell you, in this you are not right, for God is greater than any mortal, why do you complain to him? that he responds to no one's words. For God does speak, now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people, as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. Or someone may be chastened on a bed of pain, with constant distress in their bones, so that their body finds food repulsive, and their soul loathes the choicest meal. Their flesh wastes away to nothing, and their bones, once hidden, now stick out. They draw near to the pit, and their life to the messengers of death. Yet if there is an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to tell them how to be upright, and he is gracious to that person and says to God, spare them from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom for them. Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth. Then that person can pray to God and find favour with them. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to full well-being. And they will go to others and say, I have sinned, I have perverted what is right. 
but I did not get what I deserved. God has delivered me from going down to the pit, and I shall live to enjoy the light of life. God does all these things to a person twice, even three times, to turn them back from the pit, that the light of life may shine on them. This is the word of the Lord. A most great and gracious God, we would be still before you as our Lord, our Maker, and our Creator, and our Redeemer. And Lord, we would be still before you so that you may teach us, that you would speak to us, that you'd enable us, Lord, to live as your people in this world, broken, damaged, sinful, because we do have a great Redeemer. And so, Lord, we pray that in all that we think and say and do today, it will be to the glory of your name. Amen. Well, please do be seated. Uh, you will find it helpful if you have the sermon notes before you that give a summary of the things we're going to be looking at and uh, showing you where we're going. In his book, A Grief Observed, C.S. Lewis describes in agonizing detail his wife's struggle against cancer. And at one point he writes this, Not that I am, I think, in much danger of ceasing to believe in God. The real danger is in coming to believe such dreadful things about him. The real danger is this, in coming to believe in this dreadful God. The conclusion I dread is not so there is no God after all, but so this is what God is really like. Deceive yourself no longer. Now we saw at the beginning of the series that one of the issues which the book of Job seeks to face is this. How am I to think of God in the midst of suffering? And that was precisely the question that Job wrestled with intensely. He couldn't deny the existence of God any more than he could deny the existence of the Son. But he did begin to question God's good character. Remember how he and his friends had bought into the retribution theory of punishment. Good is rewarded. Evil is punished through suffering. And so, not surprisingly, Job follows the reasoning through, which can be put in this way. Suffering is punishment for wickedness. That's the major premise. Job is suffering, and he's innocent, minor premise. Therefore, God must be unjust. That's the conclusion. And this comes out, for example, in chapter 27, verse 2 where Job says, as surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made me taste bitterness of soul. So here you see Job is questioning God's righteousness. If good is rewarded and sin is punished, as set out by the retribution theory, then why is he suffering when he's innocent? And that is when he comes perilously close, not to denying God's existence, but denying God's goodness. Now, we're seeing that the book of Job is set out like a, a sort of courtroom drama, with accusation and defense going back and forth. And it ends in stalemate. Job's friends won't withdraw their witness for the prosecution that it must be because of Job's sin that he's suffering so much. And Job refuses to agree with their assessment because he claims he's innocent. And instead, he starts to point his finger in God's direction, that he is the one who is acting unjustly. But there's been someone present who has not yet been mentioned, Elihu. And he speaks as in chapters 32 to 37. Now, Elihu, unlike the other friends, is a Hebrew name, meaning he is my God. And he's not spoken because he feels that as a younger person, it is both wise and respectful to allow his elders to have their say first. 
We see that in chapter 32, verse 6. I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful, not daring to tell you what I know. But eventually there comes a point where he can no longer contain his anger. He's listened to the three counselors and he finds them all to be unconvincing. Verse 12, I gave you my full attention, but not one of you has answered his arguments. Job has run rings around them until eventually they give up trying to argue. Instead, they're reduced to adopting the attitude, we're right, you're wrong, that's all there is to it. But it is Job that he has his sight set on. And he spends the better part of six chapters rebuking Job and defending God. Now, although Elihu is younger than the others, his poetry is coming out in his speeches is far more powerful, far more sophisticated than any of theirs. So this is no young upstart. He has some measure of spiritual insight and maturity. Now, it's obvious that Job has incensed Elihu. Not because of his protested innocence, Elihu believes him on that score, but because he is so eager to clear his own reputation at the expense of God's. We saw that in uh, chapter 32 and verse 2. He became angry with Job. Why? For justifying himself rather than God, or even at the expense of God. The same appears in chapter 33, verse 8. He says to Job, you've said in my hearing, I heard these very words, I am pure and without sin. And yet God has found fault with me. He considers me his enemy. He fastens my feet in shackles. He keeps close watch in all my paths. But I tell you, in this you are not right, for God is greater than man. Then again, chapter 34, verse 12. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. That is what Job's been implying. So he's saying, in effect, to Job, look, you may well be as innocent as you say, and it will not do for your three friends to bring that into question. But by the same token, Job, it will not do for you to bring into question God's goodness. You may not have sinned so grossly when you started out, but you're coming pretty close to doing it now. You are wrong. Now, there are basically two reasons Elihu gives as to why Job is going down the wrong path in his thinking and his accusations that God is acting unrighteously. The first reason why Elihu believes Job to be misguided is because God is greater than man. Not simply that he's more powerful, but that his plans and his purposes are on such a grand scale, far more complex and involved than our tiny minds can even begin to fathom. In the words of Isaiah 55 verse 9, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You see, Job says to Elihu, your problem is that you're viewing God as if he were simply man writ large. As if he were nothing more than a sort of capricious, spiteful tyrant acting without reason. Just because we cannot see the reason doesn't mean there isn't one. God's time scale and God's concerns are much, much bigger than ours, and we need to remember that. But secondly, following this line of thought through, <clears throat> Helios suggests an altogether different perspective for understanding suffering. Instead of looking back to some kind of cause for suffering, is this suffering due to Job's sin or God's injustice when in fact it's neither? Helios suggests a more profitable way would be to look forward to try and identify some purpose in the suffering. In other words, if God is good, and God is wise, 
And the supremacy of wisdom is celebrated in chapter 28 with the most marvelous song. What we need to ask is, what possible good could there be for God to allow suffering like this? Now, the answer Elihu gives is that it is part of God's way of correcting us and preventing us from going off the rails entirely. As he puts it in chapter 33, it is to turn man from wrongdoing and keep him from pride to preserve his soul from the pit. In chapter 33, verse 19, he speaks of man being chastened on a bed of pain. Later, he claims that God makes people listen to correction. Chapter 36, verse 10. He speaks to them through affliction. Now, Job has been complaining that God has not spoken. But Eliu suggests he is speaking. Now one way, now another. Chapter 33, verse 14. That he is speaking to Job through the suffering. Now, Job's other friends insisted that God should be primarily thought of as a judge, the dispenser of this retribution. But Elio suggests a different picture, that perhaps we should think of God as a teacher. Chapter 36, verse 22, who is a teacher like him. In other words, it is too narrow a view to think of all suffering as God's retribution. May it not be that some suffering is God's instruction. The Puritan Richard Baxter writes, Though the word and spirit do the main work, yet suffering so unbolts the door of the heart that the word hath easier entrance. Likewise, his fellow Puritan Thomas Watson says, a sickbed teaches more than a sermon. Isn't that so? Now we're getting very close to having some insight as to the purpose of this pain. For Elihu is not rebuked by God at the end of the story as are the other friends. Why? Well, perhaps because Elihu is pretty near the mark in what he said. As Don Carson puts it, here is a chastening use of suffering that may be independent of some particular sin. Its purpose may be preventative. It can stop a person from slithering down the slope to destruction. Now, a number of years ago, um, I I watched a series on, on BBC entitled Commando. And it was all about the training of, that goes into making a Royal Marine Commando. And it was absolutely terrifying. I mean, you've really got to be special to, to be one of these guys. And watching this, I thought you could imagine some casual observer who knew nothing about what those instructors were trying to achieve would draw the conclusion that they must have hated those recruits. That they, they would have seen the instructors bullying them and shouting at them and in cases hitting them as they made the 22-mile country run with 70 pounds on their backs. And even if one did sprain an ankle or broke a bone, well, it was nothing that a a few painkillers wouldn't put right, and off they went. And it all looked pretty sadistic. But then the instructors explained what they were hoping to achieve. And they said they were putting these men through one of the most grueling regimes in the world in order to produce the best soldiers in the world, knowing that their lives and the lives of others would depend upon the training they received. In other words, they went into retribution. They were into instruction. Now, this is how C.S. Lewis describes God's design in making us more the people he wants us to be so we can see some purpose in pain. When a man turns to Christ and seems to be getting on pretty well, in the sense that some of his bad habits are now corrected, he often feels that it would now be natural if things went fairly smoothly. When trouble comes along, illness, 
money troubles, new kinds of temptation, he is disappointed. These things he feels might have been necessary to rouse him and make him repent in the bad old days, but why now? Because God is forcing him on or up to a higher level, putting him into situations where he will have to be much braver or more patient or more loving than he ever dreamed of being before. It seems to us all so unnecessary. But that is because we have not yet had the slightest notion of the tremendous thing he means to make of us. Now, I think we've got to admit that this is an idea which is rather uncomfortable to modern ears, including Christian ones. We live in a culture where pleasure is prized above all else and pains to be avoided at all costs. We tend to expect things should come to us with the greatest of ease and the minimum of discomfort. And the result is that we expect the Christian life to be easy. And the idea of that something valuable, such as having a personal relationship with God, might be so important of such great worth that it is worth going through some trouble to get it. And that grates with many. So why bother coming to church every Sunday? Why bother with the hard graft of Bible study or listening to a sermon? You know, why put it with a discipline of prayer or finding ways of serving God and His people in the church, which costs in terms of time and energy? Now, we may not always put it that way, but as we look around many of our churches today, that is the message which is coming across loud and clear. But I tell you this, in that kind of cultural climate, we can expect God all the more to shake us out of our complacency by putting us through the mill. We can put it like this. God doesn't want spoiled brats who think he owes them a favor. Rather, he wants loving, obedient children who will trust him come what way. Now, the question is, which are we going to be? Now, of course, we can be like sulky children. We can lock ourselves away in our room. We can build up resentment towards God for the way he's treating us. We can refuse to open the door in response to his knocking. And God gives us that choice. And he warns Job that he's in danger of allowing that kind of thing to happen to him. Beware of turning to evil, he says, which you seem to prefer to affliction. Chapter 36, verse 21. Or, we can be like obedient children, who while expressing their hurt, while expressing their pain, even raising their voices in perplexity, why me, Lord? Nevertheless, in the midst of difficulty, we'll ask, the Lord, what are you teaching me through this? Now, one way in which the faith, not only of an individual, can be refined, but a whole church, is, of course, through persecution. Of her experience in the dark days of the Soviet Union, when many Christians were imprisoned for their faith, one Russian believer wrote, My 15-day sentence taught me a great deal about myself. In such a situation, you see your good points and bad points very clearly. You find out where your weaknesses are. Persecution, she says, can be compared to a photographic developer. When the film is immersed in the developer, an image appears. When a Christian encounters persecution, his character becomes evident. Our church quickly learned who was ready for persecution and who wasn't. Well, will we be ready? Now, the point Elihu is making is that this is what might be happening with Job. Elihu is defending the righteousness of God. And whilst Job had not necessarily displayed sin in anything he'd done before in his suffering, 
it comes pretty close to re displaying rebellion now by bringing into question God's goodness. And so we're back to that original question with which we began. What kind of God will we believe in in the midst of suffering? Now, the problem believers face has been put in the form of a trilemma. If God is perfectly loving and good, he must wish to abolish evil and suffering. If God is all-powerful, then he must be able to abolish evil and suffering. But evil and suffering exist, therefore he can't be both good and all-powerful, do you see? Now, several attempts have been made to reduce the tension in the trilemma. But pretty well all of them amount to exchanging the Bible's revelation of God for some other idea of God. So some would deny that God is all-powerful. Uh, I remember in, in the early days when I was just ordained, I was a curate and went to a, a conference, a clergy conference. And there a deaconess was passionately arguing for what she called a weak God. She was adamant that she drew comfort from the fact that God was as weak and struggling and, and trying to get through life as, uh, like the rest of us. On the other hand, some would deny the existence of suffering, like the sect, the Christian science. And he puts it all down to the illusion of the mortal mind. But can we really believe that suffering is illusory? But then again, others would want to question the goodness of God, and especially his justice. This is a theme running throughout uh, Archibald MacLeish's play, J.B., which is a sort of modern representation of the story of Job. And at various intervals throughout the play, you get this haunting refrain. If he is God, he is not good. If he is good, he is not God. Well, whilst not going that far, Job certainly found himself struggling with the idea that God was good. God was just in the face of what he was suffering. And this is what he came close to denying, and which Elihu seeks to correct by saying, those who suffer, God delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them in their affliction. He is wooing you, Job, from the jaws of distress to a spacious place free from restriction to the comfort of your table laden with choice food. Chapter 36, verse 15. As someone has said, the message of Elihu, put simply, is this. Be patient. It is better to be a chastened saint than a carefree sinner. So what might such patience, the patience of Job, look like? which holds fast to the sovereignty of God and the goodness of God in the face of suffering. Well, let me tell you about two people who perhaps show us how. The first is Jerry Sitzer. In 1991, a drunk driver veered across the road into his car in which he and his family were traveling. <clears throat> his mother, his wife, and his daughter were all killed. Three generations wiped out in a moment. He writes about his experience in his book, A Grief Disguised, which has the rather intriguing subtitle, How the Soul Grows Through Loss. And at one point he says this, It is possible to live and be enlarged by loss, even as we continue to experience it. Sometimes I wonder about how my own experience of loss will someday serve a greater purpose that I do not yet see or understand. My story may help to redeem a, past, a bad past, or it may bring about a better future. Perhaps my own family heritage has produced a generation of absent and selfish fathers, and I've been given a chance to reverse that pattern. Perhaps people suffering catastrophic loss will someday look to our family for hope and inspiration. 
I do not know. Yet I choose to believe that God is working towards some ultimate purpose, even using my loss to that end. Well, one thing is for sure, God has used Sitz's book to strengthen and to encourage many whose hearts have simply been broken. The second person is Mary Craig, who in her book, Blessings, describes how two of her four sons were born with very severe abnormalities. And this is what she says. I do not believe that any suffering is ultimately pointless although it is often difficult to go on convincing oneself. Yet the value of suffering does not lie in the pain of it, but in what the sufferer makes of it. It is in sorrow that we discover the things that really matter. In sorrow, we discover ourselves. Now that is the lesson of Elihu. And that was to be the experience of Job. And in varying degrees and in different ways, if we believe in Christ, it will be our experience too. Shall we pray? <clears throat> our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we do have a great high priest, one who has been tested in every way as we have and yet without sin, the one who forever intercedes for us, the one who is delighted to call us his brothers and sisters. And Lord, we pray that you would enable us as we go through this veil of tears to know why we trust you, the God who knows why, even when we don't. As we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, amen.